Hello from both of your pastors here at Northfield United Methodist Church. We don't need to tell you what has happened over the last few days at the Capitol. Chances are you've been as glued to various screens as we have been. Maybe you have felt fear, disbelief, embarrassment, maybe numbness as reports tumbled in following the events in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday. As we speak today, news is still developing, but the riots and violence preceding the count of the electoral votes has already radically reshaped the week that we thought we would be having. The United Methodist Council of Bishops released a statement, and we joined them in that, affirming that it is tempting to call for peace, for order and unity. And while we do need to reclaim the peace, we can only do so while speaking the truth of the recent day's horror. It is time to name our reality, to name the deep divisions and hatred being played out in the Capitol. It is, an, it is another watershed moment, a time to raise our voices to heaven and take stock of who we as Americans have become. When your pastors discern that God was calling us to an epiphany series exploring whether humans are by divine design and default generally good, it was in part a response to the consequences of the isolation and vicious political cycle of the past year. The events of this week only highlight the urgent necessity for Christians to speak the truth of the good news even more. This week, we were reminded of the fact that we are capable of doing terrible things. We need to be reminded of what God created us to be. And we will do that frequently and without apology, with an eye on the newspaper and our feet planted on the grace and intentions of the God we know in Jesus. We were made for better, and we will keep witnessing to the good in people collectively and individually. We will tell the ancient sacred stories that should give us pause when we're tempted to write off whole chunks of humanity. And when stories of the worst in humans raise their ugly head, we recognize them, we've heard this narrative before, but we will proclaim the good news of Jesus. Good news to the poor, release of the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and liberty for the oppressed. That is how Jesus proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. Amen. Our prayer today comes to us from the Book of Common Prayer. Join me in an attitude of prayer. O wisdom on high, by you the meek are guided in judgment, and light rises up in darkness for the godly. Grant us in all doubts and uncertainties the grace to ask what you would have us do, that we may be saved from all false choices, then that in your light we may see light, and in your straight path may not stumble. Through Jesus Christ our Savior, to these words, O oh God, we add words specific to our time and our place. We pray for essential workers and frontline workers and first responders. We pray for victims of injustice and those who are working to right injustice here and the world over. We pray for those who are hurting this day in mind, body, or spirit. Finally, O oh God, we offer our hurting, wounded world to your grace, and we pray that you would offer healing in the depth of your wisdom. We seek your wisdom, O oh God, and we pray the prayer which you have taught us to pray as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
guys. It's time for the children's message with Pastor Rachel. What? You don't think I look like Pastor Rachel today? Hmm, let me do a quick look on the selfie mirror. Oh my goodness! I forgot to take off my Darth Vader mask. This is Darth Vader, and he's one of the big bad guys in the Star Wars universe, and we're kind of a Star Wars family in the Mori house. And it's intended to look big and bad and scary, and it does a pretty good job of it. If you saw someone with a mask like this, going to school or wherever we find ourselves, you'd kind of be scared, wouldn't you? I know I would be. One of the things we're talking about this month, though, is what it means to hope for the best from other people. And so here's what I'm curious about and something I'd like you to think about. Is it more fun to play with somebody who we're hoping for the best from, or is it more fun to play with somebody who we kind of expect the worst from? This is one reason why it can be kind of hard to make new friends, because we actually don't know what to expect, the best or the worst. And uh, what God calls us to is to expect and hope for the best in every person we meet, because every person we meet might actually be a new friend, even if they look like this. Now, I'm not going to give you any spoilers about how the Star Wars movie ends, but I will say that it is a worthwhile thing to begin with looking for the good in people, even new people or people we haven't met before, because it's a lot more fun to play with people who we're hoping for the best from. So this week, whoever you're playing with, I hope that it's somebody that you can try and practice looking for the best in, even if maybe it's like a sibling that you haven't had a lot of luck with that before. But maybe try it. And maybe hoping for the best, maybe you'll see it this time. Talk to you soon. The message about the cross doesn't make any sense to lost people. But for those of us who are being saved, it is God's power at work. As God says in the scriptures, I will dis destroy the wisdom of all who claim to be wise. I will confuse those who think they know so much. What happened to those wise people? What happened to those experts in the scriptures? What happened to the ones who think they have all the answers? Didn't God show that the wisdom of the world is foolish? God was wise and decided not to let the people of this world use their wisdom to learn about him. Instead, God chose to save only those who believe the foolish message we preach. Jews ask for miracles and grief. Greeks want something that sounds wise, but we preach that Christ was nailed to a cross. Most Jews have problems with this, and most Gentiles think it's foolish. Our message is God's power and wisdom for the Jews and the Greeks that he has chosen. Even when God is foolish, he is wiser than everyone else. And even when God is weak, he is stronger than everyone else. My dear friends, remember what you were when God chose you. The people of this world didn't think that many of you were wise. Only a few of you were in places of power, and not many of you came before important families. But God chose the foolish things of this world to put the wise to shame. He chose the weak things of this world to put the powerful to shame. What the world thinks is worthless unless and nothing at all is what God has used to destroy the, what the world considers important. God did all this to keep anyone from bragging to him. You are the God's children. He sent Christ, he sent Christ Jesus to save us and to make us wise, acceptable and holy. So us, if you want to brag, do what the scriptures say and brag about the Lord. On Christmas, God was born and became the person of Jesus. And what kind of world was Jesus born into? Was Jesus surrounded by people who were good or people who were evil? Did Jesus become part of a species that is inherently good or evil? Well, I think it's safe to say that if God chose to become human, then there's clearly something about humans that is good. This sermon continues our series where we're placing Rutger Bregman's book, Humankind, in conversation with the Epistle to the Corinthians. When Blake read the scripture today, you heard him talk about the wisdom of the world and the foolishness of the cross and how God is always willing to thwart the wisdom of the world. But what is the wisdom of the world and what does the cross show as foolish? You know, the Greek philosopher Diogenes wandered the countryside. He said he was in search of one honest man. He was the founder of a school called Cynicism. He says he never found that man. Uh, he was a founder of a school called Cynicism, a word which these days refers to a personal belief that people are inherently selfish, self-interested, self-motivated, and that the natural order of things leads to corruption. 
You've probably heard of cynicism before. Uh, there's some quotes, some great quotes around it, such as, idealism is what precedes experience. Cynicism is what follows it. Or Lillian Hellman is credited as saying, cynicism is an unpleasant way of saying the truth. George Bernard Shaw, the power of accurate observation is often called cynicism by those who do not possess it. Can you relate to those quotes? Do you understand what cynicism is? Maybe you felt cynicism. Maybe you are a cynic. Maybe you found yourself uh, in cynical frames of mind. Cynicism is what often masquerades as the wisdom of this world. And when you develop modern cynicism into a worldview, into an idea of how people behave, it becomes something called veneer theory. Veneer theory says that there is this thin veneer over us, this thin veneer of civilization, that when we're living in this thin veneer, uh, we treat each other well, we're good neighbors, we mow the lawn, uh, we care for other people in our neighborhood, and we care for other people who don't have what we have, uh, that there is an inherent generosity to how we are when we're civilized. But that any of us are two meals away from breaking that sense of civilization, that inherently we are bloodthirsty, self-interested brutes, that, as Thomas Hobbes said, life is nasty, brutish, and short, and it is only that thin veneer of civilization that prevents us from acting like animals. And that thin veneer is easily broken. It's not just an idea. It's something that's been supported by studies and experimentation. Uh, Philip Zimbardo, a Stanford professor in 1971, you may have heard of the Stanford Prison Experiment. What happened is he took a bunch of grad students, some of them became prison guards, some of them became prisoners, uh, and they were placed in a prison setting. He wanted to see what would happen, and what would happen shocked the world. He recorded some of this on footage. The guards were so mean and brutal. If you've seen any footage from this, it was probably one of the prisoners uh, sitting in his cell crying out, I can't take this anymore, can't you see I'm burning up inside? The prisoners experienced PTSD, symptoms of anxiety. The experiment had to be canceled before its seven-day run was completed because of how horribly the guards were acting. The lesson that Zimbardo and the world took from this experiment is that we are all capable of the most heinous acts when given a little bit of power over somebody else. Is that a wise conclusion? You see, it turns out that Zimbardo didn't actually mean to test how the guards would behave. He was hoping to test prisoner behavior. But the story that we tell is about an experiment on the guards. But you know how he interacted with the guards? He told them in advance to be as sadistic as they possibly could. He offered specific advice, specific techniques, and he told the guards that he was on their side against the prisoners. So of course the guards were going to behave the way their professor is telling them to behave. One guard said, I started out with a definite plan in mind of what I was going to do and how I was going to do it to those poor kids. And the student who was filmed having the breakdown actually didn't experience PTSD or anxiety. He told his professor immediately when the camera had stopped that he was faking it. He was faking it to get out of the experiment because he felt like he'd rather be studying, and he was surprised that he hadn't been able to study for the first three days of the experiment anyway. It was sensational, and it was misleading. The Stanford Prison Experiment was false. Now, just because that experiment was false, does that mean that it's wrong to say that power corrupts or that we inherently use our power in incorrect or inaccurate ways? No, maybe. You see, the BBC did a study with a TV show uh, in the early 2000s called The Experiment, where they wanted to recreate that experiment. The only difference is that they did not tell their volunteer prison guards how to behave. But they filmed seven episodes of prisoners and prison guards volunteering from society playing these roles. And you know what they discovered these guards did when they had power over these strangers? 
Not a dang thing. According to a review in the Sunday Herald, uh, the reviewer said, what happens when you put good men in an evil place and film it? Not that much, actually. By the seventh episode, the prisoners and the guards voted to start a pacifist commune. So what happens when you do put people together and give some power over others? Are those with power going to act sadistically? The evidence of that experiment, which yielded 10 peer-reviewed studies, was that they won't. They might start a commune. Now, it's not just the Stanford experiment that we looked to for these situations, though. Uh, we also looked to the Stanley Milgram experiment. Uh, Stanley Milgram was a professor at Yale in 1961. Uh, and he was trying to figure out how could so many people, so many Germans in World War II have ended up uh, working these concentration camps supporting the system of the Holocaust. What is it that leads us to do that? So he figured out a test where he's, maybe it's about authority. So he had a man in a lab coat tell volunteers to deliver lethal voltage to a person on the other side of a window who they could see. They had a dial in front of them. The dial went from zero to a number that was past the lethal mark. And the man in the lab coat would tell the volunteer to keep on turning up the voltage. He said it was an experiment on how uh, this person on the other side would experience the voltage. The person on the other side actually didn't experience any voltage. There was no electricity involved. It was a paid actor who was paid to act like they were in varying degrees of pain according to where the dial was set. What Milgram found was that while some people quit the experiment and some people stressed out, 65% of his volunteers pushed that dial past the lethal mark even if they did so somewhat unwillingly. 65%. What lesson do you take from the idea that 65% of people would listen to an authority when it meant killing a stranger and go ahead and do it? He concluded that any medium-sized town could find citizens to staff a death camp. Is that a wise conclusion? Well, it turns out that one of Milgram's assistants was able to publish years later some of the data that never made it into that first published study that he did. And what that data show is that 44% of the participants believed that although there was like a lethal mark on the dial, clearly it couldn't actually be lethal because they'd volunteered for a Yale experiment and Yale's medical school would not give them the ability to kill somebody else. So they didn't believe that lethal meant what it meant anyway. And of the other 56% who thought that that dial did mean lethal, that they were actually going to administer a lethal shock, the vast majority of them quit rather than do it. A review of the data published in August of 2019 said that their key finding of this deep dive into Milgram's data shows that obedience to authority is not as unreasoning and automatic as Milgram would have had us believe and it recommended that we revise fair-minded textbooks and historical accounts to reflect that we are not as willing to succumb to authority or listen to authority to do heinous acts as Milgram would have had us believe. So what is wise? Do we embrace the cynic's perspective? Do we embrace veneer theory, the idea that we are just a thin little bit away from anarchy and from being evil to our fellow person? Or do we understand that humankind is capable of great good? The world thinks that wisdom is about expecting the worst, expecting harshness, expecting bad things from others, and each of these studies uh, supports that narrative. And each of these studies was misleading. The wisdom of the cross is really knowing not to fall for the wisdom of the world, not to fall into cynicism, not to base your decisions on an assumption of the worst, but instead to see evidence of what is best in the people all around you. On the cross, Jesus showed us what we are capable of, that we can give our whole lives for others. 
Now, is that only a Jesus thing? I think we've all got nine plus months of evidence in our lives to look back and say, no, it's not. Nurses, frontline workers, police officers, firefighters, and hospital chaplains, so many people are giving us examples every day of how they put their own lives on the line, how they risk their own lives for the sake of others in order to be of service and to help their fellow human person. Examples of people willing to risk their lives for others abound. Evidence of human goodness abounds. So which is more true, that the worst in us normally wins out or that what's good in us normally does? The wisdom of the cross is having faith in what the world thinks is weak. The good in me, the good in you, the good in God. The world might think that those things are weak, but we, we reject the cynicism that masquerades as wisdom. That is Paul's call on us to embrace the foolishness of the cross. The foolishness of the cross is wisdom, and that is an embrace of the good. Now, maybe like me, you do normally lean a little more towards or find more sympathy for that cynical perspective. Maybe you're more prone to expect the worst than to hope for the best. We'll talk in future sermons about how to reject the wisdom of this world and what we can do to more fully embrace the cross and its foolishness and its optimism. But for this week, just pay attention to your own thoughts and notice if you catch yourself thinking uh, the worst, if you catch yourself anticipating the next bad thing to happen from a story, if you catch yourself thinking the worst about another person or anticipating the worst for someone. And instead, ask yourself, what if the next thing that happens is what's best? What if the next thing that happens is the best in them? What if they are already acting from the goodness that is present in their heart? Ask yourself that question and pray. Pray that the other people in your life are asking themselves that same question about you. This week, embrace the foolishness of the cross and reject the cynicism that masquerades as wisdom in this world. Accept the foolishness and understand that that means accepting and expecting the best in humanity, the best in you, the best in your neighbor, because God sees the best in all of us. Mm -hmm.